day, my friends, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Daily Torah Broadcast, a ministry of the Messianic Discipleship Institute. Today we are in part 33 of our series on God's plan for humanity, and as always, I pray you've been enjoying this series so far. Remember, you can always visit us at mymdi.org. Yesterday we discussed the symbolism of the two goats used during the Yom Kippur service, and how the one for Azazel, Satan pitches the accuser of the brethren, will be cast into a bottomless pit and sealed for a thousand years. Today we will see how God is a God of justice, as well as a God of compassion and mercy. You know, after the high priest has placed the blood on the altar from the slain goat, he returns to the live Azazel goat, as we discussed yesterday, and he confesses. He puts back on the top of his head the sins where they belong, the sins of the people on the goat, and is driven into the wilderness by a fit man, symbolic of a strong angel, as we discussed in the book of Revelation. And he is said to be driven off a cliff, picturing the bottomless pit. In Leviticus 16, verses 20 to 22, we read, when he has made an end of atoning for the holy place, the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall present the live goat, and Aharon shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions, even all their sins, and he shall put them on the head of the goat and shall send him away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who is in the readiness, or a fit man. And the goat shall carry all their iniquities on himself to a solitary land, and he shall let the goat go in the wilderness. Now what a beautiful picture of the redeemed high priest laying the sins back on the head to whom they belong. Final justice is coming, my friends. It is very close. Is not God a God of justice as well as of compassion and mercy? Who is the real author of our sins? Well, the devil, of course, is the author of them, even as Yeshua is the author and finisher of our salvation. You see, all through history, we got this type and we got this anti-type. We have this Christ and we have the Antichrist. It is a world of good and of evil. And Yeshua took our sin, our blame, and our guilt upon himself as an innocent substitute sacrifice. He was an innocent victim. He loved us and was willing to die for us. Our guilt, our sins were born by him and him alone, and God forgives them when we repent and accept his sacrifice. But is this full justice if we stop right here? The real cause, the actual author of those sins, was Satan the devil. It is justice for Yeshua to bear the guilt that is not his while the devil goes off scot-free, is it? Do you not suppose that God's great plan will finally work full justice by placing that original blame and guilt right where it belongs? The Azazel goat carries away the sins of all the people already forgiven. These sins already were fully paid for by Yeshua's substitute sacrifice symbolized by the killing of the innocent goat before those same sins were finally laid on the live goat. They had been previously paid for by the death of the slain goat. The devil is the real author of all sin. Can we then be finally made at one with God as long as this instigator of sin is with us? Can we not see he must first be driven away? And there would be no justice with God unless his own guilt and our sins were placed right back on his head. Is it justice for Yeshua to bear the devil's guilt as well as our own guilt for our sins? Of course not. Yeshua has carried our sins, but must he continue to carry them? 
Should they not be removed entirely from us and from the presence of even of the presence of God? As God told the serpent during Adam and Eve's fall in Genesis 3.15, Yeshua would crush the head of the serpent in time. The driving away of the second live goat shows the final atonement by placing the sins on their author where they belong. In the complete removal of the sins and their offer from the presence of God in his people, and thus the complete deliverance of the people from the power of Satan. Are you beginning to understand this picture? Do you see God's plan for humanity and how each step has to be played out before the other step can be fully carried out? Yes, my friends, we will finally, at this stage in God's plan for humanity, be at one with God. Finally, we will be one with God as he planned for us at the very beginning. The road was long and rough, but his faithfulness and love for us has never wavered or waned. He longs to be with us and we with him forever. Forever is a long time. You were made, as Paul says in Ephesians 2, he says, you were made alive when you were dead in transgressions and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the powers of the air, the spirit who now works in the children of disobedience, among whom we also all once lived in the lust of our flesh, doing the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy for his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Messiah. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and made us to sit with him in the heavenly places of Messiah Yeshua, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and kindness towards us and Messiah Yeshua, for by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works that no one would boast. You believe that, right? We hear that. We know that, right, brethren? Paul states that without him, it is a gift of God that without Messiah, we would not be able to to be heirs and joint heirs with him and be forgiven. And by grace, we have been saved. This, my friends, is what the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, is all about. But if you're not observing these days and you have no recollection or knowledge of what's going on and how it's all going to play out in God's plan for humanity, you, 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 you don't know what's going on. You, for, you, you miss it all. You miss what God is revealing to us. But how do we prepare, my friends? How do we observe this day in fasting and in prayer? Well, I want to share some points on how you can have a blessed Yom Kippur as you fast and you humble and you afflict your human bodies, your souls, but elevate your spiritual body, your spiritual soul, closer into God's presence. So let's go through some of these points. You can jot them down or just listen back again. But let's review. There's a few points here that will help you prepare for a good fast as you observe this Day of Atonement. You know, fasting is going 24 hours without food or water. Don't let people say, well, you can drink water. A real fast is without food or water. Yeshua fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. Elijah fasted. All the prophets of old fasted. Moses fasted. 
And it represents a pure, glorified state of being where the spiritual beings do not need food or water. You know, angels don't need food or water. Yeshua doesn't need food or water. But we, as human, carnal, fleshly beings, we still need food or water or we're going to die. Fasting is going 24 hours without food or water, representing a pure, glorified state of being. So a week before Yom Kippur, gradually make the switch from caffeinated to decaf coffee or tea to avoid a caffeine headache and begin drinking lots of water a few days before the fast. During the day before the fast begins at sunset, eat a normal breakfast, drink lots of water, have a big lunch. Bigger than normal, but a smaller dinner. And drink several glasses of water before the sun sets. The fast day itself should be spent in prayer, in Bible study, and with a holy convocation. Most congregations who observe Yom Kippur will have a what's called a kol nidre evening service when the beginning of the fast starts. And then they'll have a morning service service the next day, and usually throughout the the day, there will be times of uh, prayer and Bible study. Um, Many people read the book of uh, um, Jonah during during that day, and many tend to get weak. You know, if you're not preparing, many tend to get weak the last few hours of the fast, and if you do, just rest. Pray for strength. And lie down if you begin to feel too weak. I did this for many, many years at the beginning of my walk. And, you know, I had low sugar. And if I didn't eat, I would get shaky. But every time during the Day of Atonement, I would have a wonderful day with no food or no water. I would get shaky or weak. I'd get weak, but then the Lord would strengthen me. But I didn't get sick. I didn't get headaches. The Lord always will bless you if you honor him on this day. Children under five should not fast. Even older children should only maybe partially fast or do when they feel inspired by God to wanting to obey that. Don't force your kids to to fast if they're not spiritually ready to do so. But if you um, prepare them and you teach them, you will find that most kids will want to try it. And they'll want to fast it, and they'll understand more so than you think. But don't baby them, but let them make the choice. But you should prepare them and get them ready as they get older, especially when they become bar, or bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah age and around 13. Then after that, they, they should um, be fasting. Now, elderly people and those who are on medication, they should continue to take their medication during a fast. You know, you don't want them to have a medication issue. So, let you know, there's no problem with that. And then break the fast with a glass of water first, some orange juice or some other juice, a nice bowl of soup before eating anything too heavy. Because if you, believe me, after your, your fast, you don't want to eat a lot. You want to take it slow so you don't get sick or upset stomach. So just... Drink some water, get some sugar in you, so drink some OJ, some fruit juice, and a nice bowl of soup. We always break the fast, a nice bowl of soup, and then later on, maybe have a, you know, a a sandwich or something that's not too heavy. And then look at the fast as a pleasing service to God. He would not ask you to do something you cannot do, okay? He will guide you through it, and you, believe me or not, you will feel refreshed and rejuvenated afterwards. So enjoy, look forward to it. It's coming up. So I pray that you have a wonderful Yom Kippur, a great day of fasting. I pray that these messages have been a blessing to you. Uh, So until tomorrow, remember to share this message with your friends and family. Uh, Subscribe to us. And visit us on our website at mymdi.org. And tomorrow we're going to begin the next step in God's plan for humanity, the marriage supper. So don't miss it. 
This is going to be a great couple of episodes, so don't miss these next episodes on the Marriage Supper. So I went a little long today, but I wanted to get all this in to finish it up for today on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, a vitally important day. So until tomorrow, Shalom Aleichem, God bless.